Hi, I am Dr. Kavita Bapat. Today's topic is postmenopausal breathing uh, for the graduates, postgraduates, and practicing OBGYN. Learn simply. Postmenopausal breathing, very important topic. I remember those days when I was a student in medical college. And the patient of menopause, postmenopausal bleeding used to come. The way of treating last 30 years has changed so much. The definition, right from definition to anything, so many things have changed. And what, how we have reached from last uh, 30 uh, years from how to treat uh, postmenopausal bleeding is very, very important. It's a permanent cessation of normal menstruation and women who have stopped menstruating for 12 months. And the important thing is the mean age of menopause is 51 with a normal range from 45 to 56 years. Now the postmenopausal bleeding, it's called PMB in a short form. It's a bleeding from the genital tract occurring at least once a year following the session of, the session of spontaneous menstruation. It is serious symptoms and it indicates the presence of malignant disease in the genital tract can be a malignant disease or sometimes some benign diseases or something like that. So every woman with PMB should be assumed to have a carcinoma until full investigations have proved to the contrary. So it doesn't come into the PMB definition, but the endometrial carcinoma is an important reason for the PMB. So it should be taken care of. Now I'm just talking about the case-based approach. There is a female who is a 65-year-old complaining of vaginal bleeding. Her last menstrual period is at the age of 52 and she has not taken any hormonal replacement. And she was diagnosed with a type 2 diabetes 20 years ago and treated with oral hypoglycemic drugs. Chronic hypertension she has and treated with antihypertensive. Height is only 160 centimeter and her weight is 90 kg. So her BMI is also very large. Physical examination is normal. Normal size of uterus, no vulvar, vaginal, cervical lesions. Now how to approach her? So this is the case-based approach. Now approach to the BMB management. The history is very, very important with all the points we should be bothered about. The first is the last, when the last period is, when the bleeding started, what are the precipitating factors such as trauma. And the, sometimes there's a, what is the natural of nature of the bleeding. It's a temporal pattern, duration, post -coital. What is the quantity? Now the risk factors of endometrial carcinoma, we should there be diabetes, hypertension is there, high BMI and a late menopause. Sometimes nulliparity is also important. And use of unopposed estrogen is there. And any associated symptoms along with the PMB is very important, such as pain, fever, or changes into the bladder or bowel function. Now, with history, we should find out the associated symptoms, like I said, the pain, fever, and the bladder bowel symptoms. Now, there is a personal history of breathing disorders. We should take the history of. And the patient's medical history, is she taking any medications, HRT, she's having a coital relation. What is her past obstetric history? What is post-surgical history? and at least when the smear being taken normal or the cervical malignancy. Now the clinical examination on a systemic examination should be performed to look out the systematic illness. It gives the indications patients general health, obesity, thyroid, pallor, pulse, blood pressure, weight loss, cachexia, fever, all these are points should be considered on abdominal examination. There should be external and internal anatomy of the female genital tract is very crucial and we should do the proper internal examination as well as the abdominal examination. Per speculum examination, in the case of postmenopause bleeding as well as in any case, we should consider it and should do it. Now the aim of examination to find out the bleeding site, bladder, rectum, vulva, vagina, cervix or uterus any suspicious lesions from tumor, foreign body, laceration, polyp, senile atrophic vaginitis, ulceration, or sometimes a drain pessary. And we should assess the size, contour, tenderness of the uterus per rectal examination to exit the colorectal problems. Now the atrophic vaginitis is a majority of women with PMB will be found to have the atrophic vaginitis, the vaginal epithelium things, and the breakdown to the response to the low estrogen level 
This is a benign condition and relatively easy to treat with a tropical estrogen. So it's a very, very, very common postmenopausal bleeding reason. So we should examine the patient properly and treat it with the estrogen. Now there are some cervical polyps. Either so, uh, this we can see through the perspeculum examination. And we should do this type of patients, the endometrial suction curate, endometrial brush, if it's needed, and the cervical smear of these patients are very, very important. Within the spatula or the liquid-based cytology, we should do the thing. And if it's come negative, the colposcopy has the answer for this type of patient. Endometrial biopsy, again, is very important. Remove under direct visualization of hysteroscopy, or sometimes without hysteroscopy, we can do the dilatation and curatage of this type of patient and find out. But the hysteroscopy is a gold standard. It allows the direct visualization of the uterine cavity. Now, again, the hysteroscopy, so many instruments are coming up and the best, best approach available nowadays for the postmenopausal bleeding and we should do it. Now, the general examination, complete blood count, coagulation studies, LFT, RFT, chest x-rays, special investigation sampling, outpatient endometrial sampling, Endometrial biopsy is effective diagnostic technique in a simple to perform, does not require anesthesia and generally well tolerated by the patient. There are now many devices for performing the endometrial biopsy in outpatient settings. There's a Vibra aspiration, pipple sampling, most commonly used this discomfort, hysteroscopy, and direct endometrial biopsy. Now, the in, inpatient endometrial sampling, again, the dilatation and curatage with Hysteroscopy is a gold standard and it requires anesthesia and so high suspicion of cancer can be diagnosed with a hysteroscopy and curatage. These are the things. Hysteroscopically guided endometrial embassy is not 100% sensitive and detecting the endometrial carcinoma. Now the unnamed, the most important is the ultrasound. We should know the endometrial thickness. It's give the right measurement of the thickness can we are able to treat how to treat the patient. The measurement of endometrial thickness by transversal ultrasound may roll a screening in the uterine malexia with the pen, uh, this PMD. Endometrial teaser cutoff point is 4 to 5 mm on the ultrasonography is suggestive of endometrial pathology in such women. Unfortunately, ultrasound cannot be used and replace the endometrial biopsy as means to exclude the endometrial cancer. And the saline sonohistogram has also role to find out the polyps. Now there is a, these are the transvaginal sonography and we find out the endometrial thickness. Now the postmenopausal bleeding with the transvaginal ultrasound, endometrium less than four, repeat sonography at four to 12 months. If the bleeding continues, normal findings, secretory or proliferatory endometrium. If it's more than 4M, then the diffuse thickness of endometrium, endometrial bias is the answer. If it's abnormal, treat based on the diagnosis. Focal mass or thickening, again, we should treat. Focal thickening of the endometrium, hysteroscopy is the answer. Now, further investigations for the PMB is MRI, which is a, again another gold standard nowadays. It is expensive, but it's very, very important used to evaluate the endometrial thickness, predict the myometrial invasion in the patient and suspect to have the cancer. MRI is an early stage of cancer and CS125 is another important tumor marker. These are the causes of the postmenopausal bleeding, the local arc right from the endometrial carcinoma, leosarcoma, endometrial hyperplasia, endometritis and endometrial proli. There can be in a cervix like cervical carcinoma, cervicitis, cervical polyp, cervical trauma. In vagina, vaginal carcinoma, senile atrophic vaginitis, vaginitis trauma, foreign body, pessary, vaginal inflammation, and vaginal polyps. Now, other local causes can be the vulvar carcinoma, vulvar dystrophies, and vulvar trauma. And other like a fallopian tube cancer, secondary tumors, ovarian breast, colorectal cancers, and urethral current. Systemic causes for the postmenopausal bleeding are breathing disorders like thrombocytopenia, leukemia, pancytopenia, and patient may be on the anticoagulant therapies. Sometimes the hormonal replacement, estrogen producing tumors, and peripheral conversion of endostandion. So these are important common, but most common etiology is atrophic vaginitis, estrogen therapy, endometrial or cervical polyps, endometrial hyperplasia, endometrial carcinoma, and cervical carcinoma. 
Now the endometrial hyperplasia is an abnormal proliferation of the endometrium. It accounts 5 to 10% of PMB. It's because of the excessive estrogen stimulation, more than 3 mm of the postmenopause is significant and 5 mm on those on HRT. Now the classification, hyperplasia without atypia, risk of treatment is a progesterone, oral preparation, LNGIUS, hyperplasia with atypia is a pre-malignant, is a total abdominal hysterectomy as a significant risk of uh, this progression of malignancy. Now the endometrial hyperplasia, unopposed estrogen, natural history, simple hyperplasia, no typicia, complex hyperplasia, no atypia, complex hyperplasia with atypia and endometrial carcinoma, simple hyperplasia, no atypia, progesterone, complex hyperplasia, no atypia, progesterone, complex hyperplasia with atypia, hysterectomy and progesterone, endometrial carcinoma, minimal invasive vaginal hysterectomies with a bilateral salpingophorectomies. Endometrial carcinoma is the second most gynecological cancer. Adenocarcinoma arising from the lining of the uterus and it is uterine dependent. Account 10% of the postmenopausal bleeding and 90% of the patient with endometrial cancer will represent the bleeding. Now these are the four stages confined to the uterine body, involves the cervix outside the uterus and extended to the bladder and rectum. And the treatment are very simple again, the typically with PMB risk factors, then diagnosis by biopsy, and a treatment by the hysterectomy as well as the washings and sulfogophoral lymph, lymph node evaluation. The need, need of the post-operative adjuvant radiotherapy determined by the recurrent cirx, and the patient with the disease confined with the endometrium with little or no invasion of the uterine muscles and cancer deeply the uterine and the radiochemotherapy is indicated. The prognosis is good when the disease is detected early. So again, these are the stages and these are the treatment. Now the management of the bleeding, correct the general condition, hospitalization, assessment of the blood and blood volume loss, excessive and rapid life threatening. So if needed, blood is to be given, rapid restoration. Now definitive treatment, the condition after diagnosis, treatment according to the underlying cause. And thus take home message is very simple should be taken seriously and investigated. If recurrent, good to take out the uterus and HRT should never be prolonged. So the postmenopausal bleeding last 30 years, it has evolved. In our time of last 30 years, we just, just used to do the DNC because no sonography and nothing. So the diagnosis like that, or we used to remove the uterus at that time in a postmenopausal bleeding. But now the time has changed. We can evaluate patient from right from um, uh, right from diagnosing through sonography, MRI, and we can save the uterus if it's needed. And if it has to be removed, it is removed in a proper manner. So the postmenopausal bleeding should be taken very, very seriously and properly investigated. Thank you so much for the patient listening. Thank you so much.